We are live now. Yeah. Good evening and warm welcome to the 23rd lecture of active learning session for pediatric orthopedic fellows. I am Dhiran Ganjwala, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon practicing in Ahmedabad. The aim of this session is to learn basics from the world expert. So the basics of pediatric orthopedics from the world experts. The topic for today's session is very important and very practical for all of us. You will agree with me that onsetic treatment is a real game changer. And those who are in practice for more than 30 years, they have seen the transition from the surgical treatment to onsetic treatment. From my experience, I can say that for an idiopathic club foot, onsetic treatment can correct almost 100% of cases. But one thing which I have also observed, and you are also, I'm sure that it must be your experience also, that some of the cases, approximately five to 10% of the cases, they go for relapse. So I consider relapse club foot as a challenge and still an unsolved problem. There are a lot of reasons for that. And today we are going to understand the reasons why these children go for relapse and what are the options for the management and how to deal them, how to identify all the important practical issues we will understand. We are very, very fortunate to have Professor Jaws Markindu with us to speak on this topic. Let me give a brief introduction about Jaws. He is the professor at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at University of Iowa. And he took over the vast practice of Dr. Ignacio Ponsetti. At present, he is executive director of Ponsetti International Association. And in addition to clubfoot, Professor Jaws has a good interest in musculoskeletal oncology and his research concentrate on the genetics of clubfoot and scoliosis. He has more than 130 publications and has spoken in many national and international meetings. The topic of relaxed club foot is wide. And so he's going to cover this topic in two sessions. Please note that the second session will be on the 25th of May at the same time. So after that, now uh, we will have a lecture for almost uh, 60 to 70 minutes. And after that, we will have a, a question and answers for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, he will give us an idea that what he's going to cover in this session and what he's going to cover in the next session. So with that, I hand over to Jaws. Yeah, uh, you can start screen sharing and please unmute yourself. Thank you. Well, good evening uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to participate in these uh, sessions and specifically for the invitation to talk about relapses. It's for me a, a privilege and an honor uh, to speak to all of you. Uh, when uh, uh, we're thinking about clubfoot and how do we do uh, manage relapses in clubfoot, I thought that it would be interesting to actually uh, divide it into uh, sessions. Uh, the first one today is going to be on the history, the biological aspects and treatment, treatment principles. And then the next session um, in two or three weeks, it will be about pronostic factors, uh, identification and management. Uh, so I hope that with uh, with these two lectures, uh, we will cover um, the topic of relapses um, in depth. Uh, these are my disclosures. Now, anytime we talk about clubfoot and if we discuss about uh, the Ponseri method, we need to uh, make reference to uh, the late Dr. Ponseri, uh, a wonderful human being. And, and I think it's uh, especially for fellows that might not be familiar uh, with uh, Dr. Ponsetti, it might be worth and also to put in the perspective uh, what, what the topic that we're talking, which is uh, how do we treat uh, relapses in Iowa uh, for the last 70 years, actually. It would be interesting to actually have some of the highlights about uh, uh, his life and how he came about um, to study Clafford and, and the um, um, and then the now uh, called Ponsetti method. Now he was from uh, Menorca, and uh, this is Spain, and there's some islands here in a circle. Uh, he was born in 1914 uh, of a family uh, with a sister and a brother. 
uh, when he was three years old, there was a pandemic, the same one that we are now getting out uh, with COVID. It was uh, the influenza uh, pandemic, and it was called the uh, Spanish flu, uh, although it didn't originate in Spain, actually it originated in the United States. Um, so his family moved uh, from this small island to Mallorca, which is the biggest island in this uh, area. And, and it, it was a difficult time uh, because there were millions and millions of people that died. Uh, it happened with COVID, actually. Eventually, they moved to Barcelona, uh, where uh, he studied um, his uh, bachelor's, and then he did a uh, study in the medical school uh, to be a doctor. At this time, in the 30s, um, Barcelona was a very thriving city uh, with uh, one of the best universities actually in Europe at the time. And, and he studied from um, the six years of medicine that are required in Spain. And one thing is was interesting is that um, he uh, finished his finals um, one week before the Spanish Civil War started. And he was fortunate because he was the first group to do the, uh, the test. So he was able to finish. The other two groups uh, couldn't get their diplomas because they couldn't do the, uh, the test because the Spanish Civil War started. So because he was a doctor, uh, then um, he was called to the army and he became a doctor in the army. Um, the Spanish Civil War um, lasted for three years plus. And it was a very, uh, like any civil work, it was uh, very bloody and, and very difficult. Um, so there was a lot of uh, patients, I mean, soldiers and civil civilians that got hurt. Now, remember, there was no antibiotics in the 30s. So they developed the system that now is used um, in which there will be doctors in the front that will take care of the acute situation. Patients will be transferred to a middle hospital where they will be um, treated primarily. And then they will be sent to a rehabilitation uh, place as a third stage. And, and for that, they were using trains. And here you have actually a picture of Dr. Ponseti waiting for the trains to come and bring the patients to the, um, to the hospital. And every three months, the doctors will rotate on these three areas of um, uh, for for the system. Um, unfortunately, he was in the losing side, and at the end of the war, um, he uh, helped evacuate the soldiers that were wounded and civilians uh, to France. And and he was uh, in France that um, the uh, like is happening now in Ukraine and any other war in Syria. There were refugees camps uh, where the Spaniards uh, were placed, um, and he was one of them. Um, because he was a doctor, he was able to work as a doctor uh, in the hospital associated to, uh, to the confinement camp. Um, and you can see here the, um, the way it was. Um, unfortunately, the Second World War was about to start. And, and it was a very difficult time, you not know, just for Spaniards, but also for uh, Europeans. And, and, and then it was a very difficult situation because when you leave Spain at the time, you didn't have a, a nationality, you will have no passport. And so he was lucky that the government in Mexico accepted um, professionals with uh, with a professional career uh, to come to the country. So he moved to Mexico in 1939, and this is the, uh, this is the ship in which uh, he went with about 2,000 other Spaniards. And what is interesting, especially for his life, is that this same ship uh, was actually attacked by Germany on the next trip. So he was actually lucky that he was in the trip before this ship uh, was um, attacked. So he, he worked in Mexico as a, as a family doctor uh, for a couple of years. And then he met uh, Dr. Fariel, which was the chief of orthopedic surgery in, in Mexico City. 
Interestingly, and this is the connection with Iowa, Dr. Fabril was a fellow, uh, like many of you are fellows now with, with your uh, uh, mentors, uh, with Dr. Steinler, who was the head of the department at the University of Iowa. And he came to Iowa in 1913 and, and had a very, as you might know, a very important department that he uh, established and funded uh, over the years. So Dr. Farrell um, wrote a letter of recommendation um, for Dr. Ponceri. And in 1941, actually, he was accepted to come to the University of Iowa as an as a international fellow and then became a resident. Uh, this is the hospital, actually, at the time um, when Dr. Ponceri came. And now it's a, bit, it's a little bit different. And we will see some pictures later. So when he finished the residency in 1944, Dr. Steinler, as you might know in Iowa, uh, he established the uh, long-term studies and natural history studies now called evidence-based medicine or outcome research. And one of the areas that uh, he was interested in analyzing, it was clubfoot. At the time, the treatment of clubfoot was mostly surgical um, and it was posterior media releases. Um, and so Dr. Steinler asked Dr. Ponceri to evaluate the patients that he had treated over the years, since 1913 to 1944. And, and so Dr. Ponceri did a study of about 24 patients uh, that were in the mid 20s and 30s. And what he found is that uh, most of these doc patients um, had a very stiff, very weak and very painful feet. And, and there was nothing they could do for the pain other than sometimes arthrodesis or even amputations. And, and they were not normal or functional. And this was why he decided to start studying clubfoot and develop a method that would not require surgery. And so in the 1940s, um, he started developing and thinking about clubfoot and how to treat it without the need for surgery. So he did biomechanical studies as we will discuss and also biological studies to understand uh, clubfoot. And in 1963, he published a paper that I will strongly recommend everybody to read um, because um, he established already the principles of the treatment. <clears throat> so um, unfortunately, um, the uh, orthopedic community in the United States and also the orthopedic communities in uh, pretty much in any country did not recognize the value of the method and continue doing surgeries as we know. Now in 1996, uh, he published his book, uh, The Fundamentals of Treatment of Clubfoot. And, and this was one of the uh, key for people to understand uh, the treatment of clubfoot and, and start learning how to do it uh, based on the on the principles that Dr. Ponceri designed it, uh, you know, 30, 40 years before. Now, I think to understand relapses, and this is um, important, you need to understand clavful biology because relapses happen because there's a biological process underneath. Now, we are all familiar with the deformity, um, and this is the uh, kind of the way to remember for, uh, for residents and students, uh, this cavus, uh, now this adductus. Now adductus is not metatarsus adductus, and this is one of the mistakes um, that is made. Adductor means that the foot is adducted, but there's no deformity in the midfoot, okay? And this is very important because if there will be a metatarsus adductus, they will need for uh, putting pressure in the calcaneal cuboidoid as it is done with uh, metatarsus adductus, but because it's adductus of the foot, um, if you do so, as you know, um, this will lead to an inefficient correction. And then there's varus and equinus of the heel. Now, one of the issues is that we as orthopedic surgeons for years and years, and still now concentrate on the deformity of the foot, thinking that this is the main problem, that the problem is the foot. And because we call it clubfoot, then we think that the diagnosis is the foot is abnormal. And the reality is, and the most important thing is that clubfoot is a sign 
of an abnormality that happened in the lower extremity. We are all familiar with the um, dissections that Dr. Ponseri did and the deformity of the, uh, of the bones. And uh, still many people think that this deformity is the cause of cloud food. This deformity in the talus and navicular specifically is a reaction to the stresses produced by the food to be in this position. And in this beautiful study by Dr. Pirani, uh, published um, a few years ago on an MRI of how the correction um, affects the development of the foot. And you can see here very clearly that in six weeks, both the navicular as well as the talus remodel very fast. So there's no biological abnormality in the bones in the foot. The, the bones are perfectly fine biologically and they do respond like any musculoskeletal tissue to the stresses that are put in, into them um, by the stiffness created by the abnormality that actually leads to club food. So when one when, when is thinking about club food, both from day one of life to relapses, um, one has to be thinking that that deformity um, that you see is not a biological cause for club food. The biological abnormality that you can you see that leads to the deformity and is not positional. Um, this is a three-dimensional uh, ultrasound of a 17 weeks old um, baby. And you can see here the deformity and there's plenty of space uh, for the baby still in the wound. So it gets crowded at the end in the last maybe two months or three months of pregnancy. But in the middle of the uh, pregnancy, there's plenty of space. So the deformity happened because of the biological abnormality. And when you do the studies as Dr. Ponseri did and many others, what you can see is that there's an increase in cellularity um, in the tissues, mostly in the, in the muscles, uh, in the ligaments, and uh, partially in the fascias. Uh, so the soft tissues in clubfoot, in the leg of a patient with clubfoot, are thickened. Um, this is study by Dr. Ippolito, um, he did an MRI study in which um, you can see here in a newborn, no treatment before, uh, the difference between the affected side and the normal side. And this abnormality in the MRI demonstrate that it's all the muscles in the leg that are affected. Many people still talk about the posterior tip as the muscle that pulls the foot in, and, and that actually um, is, is affected as the T or tip. You can see here um, the signal um, and also the extensors that is a very weak signal and the gastrosolius, which is very small and the signal is also normal. So this stiffness comes from this biological increase of cellularity and collagen that affects the development of the leg um, in these uh, patients. Now, you can see here how in a macroscopic level, um, this abnormality happened. This is a normal muscle, and this is a muscle of a club foot. And, and you can see here that the Achilles tendon is very thick, um, and it's about almost half of the size of the complex between the muscles and the tendon. And the muscle is very small, and it has quite a bit of kind of fibrosis in between the muscle fibers. So this muscle is much less stretchable and it has a tendency um, to with growth, not to grow as fast as it needs to be um, to accommodate for the growth of the bone. Remember the bone is absolutely normal um, in, in the leg. So this is a patient of Dr. Ponseri uh, that was treated. And this is when the patient was a teenager. And you can see that this uh, different between the two sides. And actually, this is the same patient um, at the age of 50 when we did the 50 year follow up. And through the life, still the leg is a little smaller. So, this abnormality is intrinsic to the development of the leg. And that's why this abnormality, if it's not uh, properly treated, leads to relapses. Now, 
um, when you are doing the treatment, and I think this is uh, extremely important, sometimes you might face a situation like this. Um, and, and this situation is very critical. Um, it's called a complex cloud food. But the key here is that this situation happened uh, because the casting is not being done properly. But there's a second aspect that needs to be con in consideration is like, well, why this happened in this kid and not the other? And, and, and well, and the reason is because in, in this abnormality of the lower extremity, there's also abnormality sometimes of the blood vessels. And this is study by these two studies by the group of Dr. Dobbs, um, they were different in the size and location and so forth of the, uh, of the arteries that goes to the foot and that gives sense, um, uh, vascular supply to the leg. And when you have the situation that we just saw before, all this inflammation, this actually behaves almost as a compartment syndrome uh, because there's so much, there's no a lot of interchange because there's ecstasis and the veins are not able to take all the blood out. And so when you treat these patients, if you have this situation, and this is this study uh, in which you can see by MRI when the patients are older, how much you are affecting with your casting technique, the development of the muscles. And, and look at here in E, F, G, and H, mostly how the muscles are pretty much dead. And that is going to have a consequence for relapses. If this happens, you know that these patients are going to have a very high, high tendency for relapses. So the key is to prevent this from happening because you know that these patients uh, for the rest of their lives are going to have a lot of difficulties because they have no muscle pretty much. Okay, so this is why this is extremely important to consider um, to prevent relapses, right? Now, this abnormality stays, uh, and this is a patient about five, six years old, treated the Berseri method, doing fine, not using the brace anymore. Clinically, the, you know, the legs look pretty nice, but the MRI shows almost a 50% difference in the size of the muscles. And, and this is why there's a high tendency for relapses in clubfoot, okay? And what happened? Well, why this happened is because for muscle to grow and to keep the same rate of growth that requires with the bone that has zero problems, it has to be a stretch. So muscle need a stretching for growing. If the muscle is not a stretch, it won't grow as fast as it needs to be to accommodate for the growth of the lower extremity. And you can see here this situation in cerebral palsy or in neurological problems, or if the patient is being immobilized for a long time and so forth. So stretching motion is critical for muscle and um, development. And when I say muscle, is muscle tendon, um, you know, as a complex. So anything that you do for preventing this from happening or not providing a stretch to the muscle is going to lead to relapses. And in this study, the key here, and this is, uh, we will discuss this um, in the next, um, uh, the next session specifically, these are the muscles that are everting, mostly the peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, and a little bit of the stensors, but inversors is the posterior tip, yes, is very strong, and the anterior tip and the flexor. But the muscle that has the more inversion power is the gastrosoleus. Five times is stronger than any other muscles inverting the foot. And that's the reason why, you know, when you see it relapses, the first thing you see is that you start losing dorsiflexion because the soleus is so powerful. And if you remember just a couple of slides before, how much is affected by this fibrosis, then you wonder why if you don't keep the stretch, then this muscle is going to um, get tight and it's going to lead to a relapse. So it's critical to, of the children to be active during the day. 
So any brace that you use during the day, like an AFO or any other brace, is going to impair the development of the muscles and it's going to lead to relapses. So the best way to maintain the stretch of those muscles is by using a brace that keeps the flexibility during the night. And also because the kids grow during the night, they don't grow during the day, they grow during the night. So if you keep that muscle stretch, you are giving the, bio, the biological clues for the cells to keep growing and maintaining um, the length according to the length of the leg. And so this is very critical. Don't think that AFOs or any brace during the day is going to prevent relapses or is going to be able to treat relapses. Um, is a major issue, the flexibility. And the key here also is that this abnormality stays for the life of the patient, even if they are very active. And this is a patient's about maybe in the 30s, I believe it was, you can see the difference between the two legs and you can see the difference in the muscle. Now we are very lucky that after the age of six, seven, eight, relapses are very rare, maybe 3% or less. Um, even with this amount of abnormality in the development of the muscles. But functionally, I think what happened is when the patients, you know, kids get to that age, they do so much activity during the day that they don't need and they do enough stretch and enough physiologic uh, uh, stimuli for the muscles and the tendons to develop so they don't get relapses. And so they don't need the use of the brace uh, as, a, as a, a complement to, uh, to the stretch. But this is an abnormality that stays for the life of the patient. So when we think about club food, please forget about the food. There's nothing wrong with the food. The food is perfectly fine. The bones are a bit abnormal, but in six weeks with the casting, they get pretty much to normal shape and relationship. When you're thinking about club food, think about how that leg is developing and mostly how much flexibility you provide and how you keep the flexibility. So club food is actually a problem of flexibility. It's not a problem of shape. It's a flexibility issue. And if you don't keep the flexibility, then you are going to be facing relapses all the time. So now the other issue here is that when, when you talk about you know, the Ponseti method, uh, the Ponseti method is not a casting technique. The Ponseti method is actually a philosophy, I would say. So it's a comprehensive treatment uh, management um, that requires very specific way of doing the manipulation a very specific way to do the casting, no matter if it is a one day old or if it's a relapse, and a very specific method of preventing relapses, which is key. And also, if you see a relapse, a specific way of treating relapses. And, and, and when you are a Ponseti doctor, the question is not what do I need to do to treat a baby or a relapse or something? What kind of surgery should I do? A good Ponseti doctor is how can I prevent any surgery in a patient with cleft foot? Because anytime you do surgery, you are going to um, increase the stiffness and that's going to have um, uh, outcomes uh, for life of the patient. So the principles of treatment for any age, one day old, three months, six months, and even 30 years old with Club food using the Ponseti method is number one, you correct the deformity with casting. And when you say correct the deformities, you have to provide flexibility. You have to stretch the muscles and tendons and ligaments to provide as much flexibility as you can. Okay. Because the Achilles tendon, the gastrosoleus, is so tight, as you know, because biologically it's affected uh, a lot, then in most cases, um, especially in untreated patients, you need to do a tenotomy. And how many? All of them. In primary treatment of clubfoot, all of the children require a tenotomy. And it's only maybe one in 200 or something that maybe with three cars you get the foot corrected 
and in which case you don't need to do the tenotomy. But the question is not, do I need to do a tenotomy on this patient or not? All the patients need a tenotomy. So you have to, if you have a clafo clinic or you are doing clafo treatment, you know that every patient at the end of the casting is going to require a tenotomy. So you have to plan for that to happen. So don't ask, do I need or not? Is all of them need. And then the key is that once you provide the flexibility that you obtain with the casting and the tenotomy, um, then you have to maintain that flexibility. And that flexibility is maintained by the brace. Not a brace during the day, but a brace during the night. And there's a point in which bracing is very difficult for the kids and the family to tolerate, uh, which usually is around you know, four to five years of age. And in some cases, actually about 10%, and we will see the statistics later. Um, we not tolerate the brace until you do the correction with the casting. And then you will need a tendon transfer to maintain the correction. So the tendon transfer, and we will discuss this in the next session, is not a corrected surgery for club foot prolapse. The tendon transfer is a maintaining of the correction that you obtained with the casting before. So every patient has to be a stretch first, and then has to be maintained, either with a brace when they are smaller, you know, younger, or with the tendon transfer when they are older. And so if you apply these principles, it's the same for everybody. No change of babies or relapses. Now, it's very important uh, when you are doing this to be very precise. So you need a very precise position of the fingers, like the thumb on the head, on the talus and elevation of the first meta. We will discuss this in a minute. You need a precise molding of the cast. But this has to be done in a clinical setting that allows this to happen. So, and, and this is the situation that we are facing. So you have a baby that is born with club food and you want a food that is flexible and normal looking and functional. Now we have two choices. You have your knowledge in your head, and then you have your hand with an instrument, which is the knife, right? Or you have your knowledge, your hand, and an instrument that is plaster. Now, if you decide to use surgery, then you need a very complex environment with pediatric anesthesiologists, pediatric nurses, pediatric recovery, pediatric this, pediatric that, and very expensive. And you won't dare to do surgery for correction, say, if you don't have this environment, right? And you require this very complex environment. Unfortunately, and this is the same for, you know, a newborn baby or a relapse, when you use the plaster cast, that is second hand. It's like, this is like, oh, it's plaster, it's, it's dirty. I can do this anywhere. And then there's no setting for doing it correctly. And that's why many people are not able to correct as, uh, uh, as it was mentioned before, 100% of the cases, which is the case. So this is very critical. If uh, you are going to develop, if you are going to be treating clubfoot, you need to set up a, a place in which you can do the casting properly. And it's not very difficult the place. The place requires a bed and a, an assistant and yourself. In this case, Dr. Ponseri with Maria, which actually is still working in the clinic. And then for any kid at any age, the parents are the best one to actually maintain the kids calm because if they are calm, there's, you can do a much better job. And you have to do it in an environment that there's not another 20 million people around, like in a classroom in a department of orthopedics, which is there's like 10 people and the saw is using and the noise. And, and so the, people, the kid they cannot relax and then it's very difficult to do a good correction. So this, uh, this is critical. Without this, you won't get good results, neither in babies or in relapses. So now when you treat relapses, you have to go back to the basis, and it was described by Dr. Priani um, about the, you know, the compsis on clubfoot, but I think it's important to understand 
that you have to in relapses follow the same principles and the same mechanics of a baby. And that means that you have to move the subtalar joint. Why? Because the calcaneus, the navicular, the cuboid, and the cuneiforms are a solid unit. There's not a lot of motion in these joints, maybe on one degree, okay? But your foot can move 30, 40 degrees abduction and 20, 30 degrees abduction. So what that means is that the whole foot is moving underneath the talus. And so for doing correction of any case, including relapses, you have to move the whole foot underneath the talus. And that is the key, which he realized, um, you know, six, 70 years ago. And, and so the calcaneus have to rotate and then the rest of the foot in front of the calcaneus have to rotate underneath the talus in order to do the correction. If you don't do that, then you won't be able to correct. So um, all the components of the deformity are corrected together because they are a unit. So there's a mistake thinking is, oh, I'm going to correct with the first cast the cables and I'm going to correct the adductors with the second or third cast and then I'm going to correct the virus and then I'm going to correct the dorsiflexion or the plantar flexion. Everything moves together. So as you are correcting the adductors, you are correcting the virus and you are correcting the plantar flexion. And, and how you put your fingers um, in place and how you use the stretching is critical. So the technique is critical. It's not the severity. There's no severity in clubfoot much. And we will discuss that later. It's your hands. If you do it correctly, you get 100%. And most of the cases can be actually treated with very low number of, of casts. So this is why, you know, for years and years, the kite, the kite technique uh, was not successful because you are blocking the calcaneus for rotating. And when you do the Ponseti method, you have to be very careful on how you put your thumb because many times you put your thumb on the head of the talus, but your thumb is very big and actually can block the calcaneus if you don't realize that. And then you won't get good correction and it will take forever. So uh, how do you place your fingers is critical for good success. And the cables specifically require to elevate the first metatarsal, right? And that's the way you correct the cable. So you have a patient with the quinocabovirus food for charcoal marie tooth, you will be doing a, you know, a, an osteotomy to elevate the first metatarsal, right? Well, here, even in relapses, you can elevate and stretch the plantar fascia and to get correction of the cables by elevating the first metatarsal. If you pronate, then you're making worse. Now, there's another issue here is that Elevating the first metatarsal doesn't mean that you have to put the foot in supination perpendicular to the tibia, which many people do. You have to just elevate the first metatarsal. You don't need to twist the foot to put it in supination, the whole thing, okay? And, and that's another mistake that is made uh, frequently. So it's only elevating the first metatarsal and not supinating the whole foot. And as you know, you have to put pressure on the tailor head because if you just rotate the foot, like uh, it was done you know, for many years and sometimes it's done, then the talus will rotate because the forces will go to the, to the ankle and then you will have a rotation of the ankle. Like in this case, on this patient, you can see here that yes, the foot is straight, but the ankle is you know, 60 degrees rotation. And I bet you that you have seen many patients that has the lateral malleoli is in the back. If you have a patient, and especially when you are looking at relapses, if you have a patient that has the malleolus, the lateral malleolus in the back, you can think that the ankle is like this one. And so, so many people think that, oh, okay, you know, the foot is turning in, we can do a tibial osteotomy and put it straight. If you already has this deformity in the ankle, the ankle will be 90 degrees in the, in, in the wrong direction. So be very careful. And this malleolal, lateral malleoli in the back is a iatrogenic deformity. 
this doesn't happen in babies. Actually, babies have internal tibial torsion. So it's completely the opposite. So this is a major um, uh, complication, no complication, but iatrogenic deformity. So it's very critical to always feel the head of the talus, only put the pressure on the head of the talus and not the calcaneus and, and when you are doing your correction. Now, what results can you get? And, and that leads to actually relapses. Well, in this paper, and we have new data coming up that we will show in the next session. Um, uh, this was the, the decade between 1991 and 2001, uh, which is when Dr. Ponseri started to treat the patients again after retirement. And here you can see uh, pretty much 100% correction. Uh, in this case, there were uh, three or four cases that were treated outside and they have surgery, but right now it's 100%. The majority of the patients can be treated, and this is um, uh, babies uh, up to the age of two, actually, with an average of five cast. And then the relapse rate in Iowa now is 11%. And some of these cases are, you know, still young. Um, and the number of tendon transfer for relapses is 2.3%. So you can reduce the number of surgeries in patients dramatically by following the, the method properly and applying the technique properly and actually using the brace properly. Now, this is not Ponseri casting, although it was called that way. There's absolutely no molding um, and you can see sh short cast. This is not the Ponseri method, okay? And if you do something like this, and it's like, oh, the foot was very severe and it's not responding. It's not responding, but it's not done properly. Okay. And this is very critical. And then you get all these type of complications, you know, with overlapping um, rocket bottom deformity, ulcers, and then this kind of complex club foot, which are completely iatrogenic for really bad management on the casting. Okay. So, so, and, and as we see, we saw before this kind of complication, especially the complex cases, will lead to a, a, a long-term impairment of this patient. Um, and so when you look at the literature and, and you look at the literature specifically for relapses, you know, everybody has a very high level of relapses to a point of like 68% in this paper by science. I mean, now, there's many issues with these papers, uh, small groups, um, critical variations in the application of the method, different providers doing the casting. So depending on when the key comes, somebody does the casting, whoever is in the classroom that day. Um, if there is uh, a relapse, then going to surgery, and, and then they don't have follow-ups, okay? So this is what happened right now. So you do a literature, literature search, you will think that this is the main problem. It's like, oh, relapses are very common and, and then um, and, and, and there's nothing you can do. Yes, you can do things if you look at the data from Iowa. Because if you apply these same principles in the same way, you will have the same results. Now, is that real? Yes, it's real. In this systematic review, they look at the uh, Ponseri method by looking at the details, and they found that the clinical variations, means the results in different series, are results of deviations from the details regarding the manipulation, the casting, and it makes no difference if it's a baby or a relapse, the tenotomies, the, the, the abrasing, and when to do, when recognize the relapses and the management of relapses. If you read the literature carefully, most of the papers are not following the method properly. And then the results are all over the place. And then people think that is the foot the problem when the reality is the casting technique and the follow-up of the protocol for the, for the treatment. Um, this paper is very important to demonstrate this issue. Um, this was a paper between uh, those two institutions, uh, Denver uh, Children's Hospital and, and then uh, Dr. Dobbs Clinic. And when they look at the results over a period of a few years, they found that uh, in Denver, uh, because everybody, every doctor treat the patient individually without no follow-ups and adapting the method to their um, understanding, I will say, 
um, they have almost a 50% surgery rate. When in Dr. Dobbs, it was two patients of 91 and there were two tendon transfers. Now, the interesting part on this paper is that they did a follow-up. So um, one of the doctors, Gaia, actually came to Iowa and this is about, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I spent time in Iowa, a couple of weeks actually um, with me and, and we went through the process and the technique and so forth. And then when they went back, um, they established a CLAF, dedicated CLAFO clinic. And so then they published this paper, which is implementation of a CLAFO program in Denver. And you can see here, you know, um, and it was in, uh, in 2007, that um, they had a lot of surgeries up to 100% sometimes here. Look at that. Implementation of the program, pretty much no surgeries. Zero surgeries. Posterior media releases. So these two papers from, this, from these uh, groups shows clearly that when you apply the method properly and you do it in a clinic that is dedicated to club food and you follow the protocols and the technique and so forth, you can reduce the amount of surgery dramatically. Now, is that something that happened in the United States as a whole, as a country? When we did this study, um, and it was in 2017, and we asked how the POSNA members treat club food, um, and we got 321 responses, only 34% recommend the brace and four. They have a lot of relapses, 55%, 25%. When they treat the relapses, they didn't do casting. The principle is you have to stretch the tissues before you do the maintenance, either by the brace or the tendon transfer. And 43% end up doing surgeries for relapses. This is absolutely a necessary surgery if you follow the principles and the method correctly. Now, um, at the level of the country, and this paper with uh, Liu Science uh, did um, back in 2010, looking at the um, hospital database, says that in the United States, we have a national database for procedures. And, and so what was interesting is that at, you know, before 2000, the number of surgeries for platform, it was, you know, 80%. 2000, 1999 was the first course here at the University of Iowa for platform, for the Ponseti method. And then people start coming. Usually we have a course once a year in October, and then people um, will come 20 to, 20, 20 to 30 people every year. And, and you can see here at the level of the country, that when people start learning and doing the Ponseti method, the number of surgery in the first year of life, and this is the key here, went down 85%, dramatically decreased compared with before. Okay, now we follow this study and it's about to be published to look at, okay, well, this is the first year of life, that is when the babies are babies, what happened when you have relapses? and how people treat relapses. And this is the same data, the same, the same database. So when you go to 18 years of age, means the patient goes to maturity, which is when you don't have relapses anymore because you, know, you are at the end of the growth. What happened is that yes, and we went to 2012, the number of uh, surgeries in the first year of life went down 92%. So very few people get surgery babies right now. But the number of surgeries in the country for relapses stays the same in gray up to the age of 18. So in United States, although the method made a tremendous impact on the correction of babies, because the doctors don't follow the method correctly, still surgeries are performed in a very high level, same level, same type of surgeries, and you can see here, Tendon lengthening in, in, in blue is 1997 and in red is 2012. Tendon transfer, osteotomies, fusions, external fixations. So 
So this is a major challenge. And, and I hope that in India, this doesn't happen. Um, I don't know why the doctors in this country still don't understand these issues because it's to me very simple, but, uh, but the reality is that this is what is happening. Now, you have to understand what happened and what are the implications of corrective surgery, either as a baby or as a relapse, as, as is happening now in the United States um, and in many other countries, unfortunately. You know, a posterior media release, and it makes no difference how you call it, if it is Cincinnati or if it is a Turco, if it is, that is how you cut the skin. You are doing a posterior media release. You are cutting the tendons, ligaments, and, 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 and capsules, okay? no matter how approach you use. So when you put a lot of emphasis on, oh, I do it this way or that way, you are doing a posterior media release. So in this study by Dr. Dobbs, uh, published in 2004, which was a 30 year follow-up, you can see that by the age of 30, the majority of the patients have arthritis in their feet already, in one of all the arthritis and sometimes in different places, okay? so. So it happened because of the stiffness that is generated by adding the surgery to a tissue that already is a stiff by nature. And when you look at the results um, compared with the uh, Ponseti method treatment at the same age, 30 years of uh, age, and this is the paper of Dr. Cooper and Dietz uh, here from our institution, in the surgery one, 74% of the patients have fair or poor results. So only 25% of people were doing okay. And very, only two patients were excellent. So you know that by doing surgery in kids, either babies or for relapses, you are setting up these patients for a fair or poor result for the rest of their lives. And, and interestingly, this is a paper by the same group uh, published recently in which they look at the, uh, the deformity in adolescent and young adults uh, that were treated with extensive relapses. And you can see here that there's overcorrection, undercorrection, dorsal bunion, I mean, and, and the number of surgeries so high, I mean, two or three uh, more per patient and with fusions and so forth. So this has a tremendous implications for the life of the patient. When you look at, and these are all the papers published, um, on long-term studies for clubfoot, and in blue is the surgery, and in red is the uh, Ponseti method. You can see here that the papers published here at this institution uh, from when the patient was 18 at the end of the growth until 50, which is the last one, uh, which is the last paper we published, they stay in the 80 to 90%, no problem. But when you do surgery, yes, in the first 10 year old life, most people do fine. As soon as you get to adolescent, it deteriorates rapidly. And by the age of 30, only 25, 30% have okay results and function. So this is, this is the importance of avoiding surgery at any age in clubfoot. And the key here is that the quality of life is not just the function and pain, is the quality of life of these patients is dramatically reduced. And, and, and in this paper by Dobbs, they found that the uh, over a 50, which is the average for this quality of life uh, questionnaire, the number was 33 for the patients treated surgically. Now these are 30 years old people, okay? If you compare with all these other pathologies, chronic hair failure before cardiac surgery, people in hemodialysis or Parkinson, they have the same number. And these are 30 years old people. They are not 90 years old people with, with all these kind of problems. So the quality of life of patients that have surgery when they, because of clafo during their uh, you know, childhood or adolescence is going to catch on them and they are going to have a quality of life that is very poor. So that is why when you are thinking relapses, you have to avoid at all this possibility. Now, how do you approach relapses, right? Well, we have an experience which is COVID, right? And we are coming out of them, uh, thanks God. And, and then, you know, at the beginning, it was very hard and still is very hard in some, in some areas. And then you require a very complicated uh, ICU and so forth, right? But the key here is being 
the vaccine and the mask and isolation and so forth, but it's the prevention, right? Well, the same thing is for relapses. Relapses is prevention, prevention, prevention. It's not what do I do with a relapse, what surgical technique I need to use. The question and the way to approach is how do I prevent relapses so I can avoid surgery? Because if I do surgery, this patient is going to be having a quality of life miserable uh, for the rest of their lives. So the key for relapses is actually bracing. And Dr. Pirani have talked about bracing, um, but just a few special concepts. Um, the brace has to be an, a foot abduction brace, even if it is unilateral, and we will see why. And the key for braces is comfortable shoes. People have problems because the shoes are not comfortable. If the kid is crying all night because the shoes don't fit properly and, and, and it creates some red spots or whatever, then it's going to be very difficult for those parents to maintain the brace for four or five years. So the key in bracing is not, is not the bar. The key in bracing to be successful is a comfortable shoe. So in your country or in your clinic, you need to look at around and see what is the most comfortable brace that you can afford for those parents. Because if they fail, you fail. You have to work with the parents to be successful because the treatment of club foot doesn't finish with the tenotomy. The treatment of club foot finishes when the patient is 18. And no more growth and then fine for life as we saw it before, right? And then the bar is 60, 30 and so forth, which is uh, just a standard, okay? But comfortable shoes is the key. And the key here is that the phrase is to correct, maintain correction, not to obtain correction. It's a mistake that you do the casting, you do the tenotomy, the foot is not quite ready. It's like, well, it's not, well, let's put it in the brace and see if it stretches with the brace. It's not going to stretch in the brace. The brace is to maintain, not to get correction. If you don't get the flexibility, the foot is not going to fit. The patient is going to cry. The family is going to hate the brace. And then you are going to be fighting this thing for the rest of your life with this family. So, so how, the, how the brace works, and this is an important to understand what kind of brace to use. Um, this is a study that was published. Um, this is a PhD actually study by Dr. DiMeo, which is a parent of a kid with clubfoot. And when he did his PhD in biomechanics, developed this model. So he's published in um, JPO. He looked at the standard brace, the uh, flexible articulating brace, in this case, the DOPS uh, brace thing, and then an AFO. Um, so, and then he looked at different things, but as a, as uh, as uh, just uh, highlights, when you use the standard brace, it's a rotation of the hips will provide you the rotation. So you just, just move your feet and go out and it's coming from the hips. Um, and this, uh, this is a study by uh, Dr. Boyne and Sinclair that they look at if there is any effect of having the brace on rotational deformities and there's no rotational deformities uh, when you use the brace, with one exception, uh, because they use the brace just naturally. The wider is the bar, the more chances you have to create a rotational deformity. And the most common one is an external tibial torsion. If the bar is very long, you will get external tibial torsion. So the bar um, doesn't need to be very long. And, and there's a mistake to consider that the longer, the better. No, the longer is not the better. The center of the foot of the shoe has to be the center of the shoulder. It's not that the shoes have to be outside the shoulders. That is too wide or even more. And, and, and that is the problem. When you use too wide the bars, then you get external tibial torsion, which it might not recover actually, um, unless the patient is very young. And with respect to what the brace does, the brace is a stretching. Now, this is the standard brace here. 
And you can see that the posterior tear, the soleus, the gastrosoleus, everything stretches very nicely. When you use an articulate embrace, there's pretty much no stretch because it's too much motion. And when you use an AFO, it stretches a little because the foot is maintained in, in, in neutral, but you are not providing dorsiflexion or, or bringing the foot out. So it's a mistake also to use an AFO during the night because it's not going to stretch. So any unilateral brace is not as effective as a bilateral brace as the foot abduction brace. So what you provide to your patients to be successful um, is to use the foot abduction brace because it's the best for specifically maintaining and providing the flexibility required for preventing relapses. And, and there's another implication of unilateral case, unilateral braces. In this study by the Norwegian group that they published um, three or four years ago, um, they compared a standard brace with a unilateral brace. And the problem with unilateral brace is that if you want to provide dorsiflexion during the night, you have to put pressure. And if you put pressure because the standard brace doesn't put any pressure. The kid is moving. So it's a dynamic brace. But if you use a unilateral brace that is providing dorsiflexion by pressure, either with these straps or if you, are, um, if you know the ADM by putting pressure, what happens is that, and, that, and you do that for you know, four or five years, you are flattening the talus. The talus cannot grow because it's under pressure for 10 to 12 hours at night. And in this case, you can see here that most of the cases have flat talus in this study when they use the unilateral brace. And, and when you have a flat talus, it's for life. There won't be no dorsiflexion ever in this patient. There's no motion, it's flat. And that potentially can lead to arthritis of the ankle and so forth. So unilateral braces, no matter what type, in order to provide dorsiflexion, they have to put pressure during the night, and that is going to affect the development of the talus to become flat over time. So, so this is why the brace to prevent relapses, and this is the key here. When, when we talk about relapses, it's prevention. It's not what do you do when you have a three years old with a relapse. We will talk about that the next time, but the key here, the message for you is how do I prevent relapses? And, and that is the way to think about in club food. So, so there's no question that bracing is a pain for everybody, for the parents, for the kids, and for us. And there are challenges. They, they, some patients require more effort because the feet are stiffer, um, because the families are not following directions. But no, because of that, you have to just give up and say, okay, fine, then I do surgery and it will be fine which is what happened, you know, at, at least in this country, 50% of the time. And, and so, because we are busy, we are orthopedic surgeons, and, and uh, you know, and the bracing is, you know, it requires psychology, it requires personal relationship. Having somebody to help you in the clinic that will be able to work with the parents to maintain and enhance the, uh, the parents and understanding of the braces is critical. So that's why, having a dedicated CLAFO clinic is, provides much better results because everybody's thinking about the same and, and everybody's concentrated and everybody talks about the same to every patient. So this is very, very critical to get, to provide the results that the families and the kids deserve. It's not about us, it's about the kids and the families. And we have to work with them to be successful. So it's a partnership. It's not blaming the parents because, oh, you are not using the brace. We are a bad parent. Well, they didn't understand. They might have a problem with the brace. They might lose the brace. They might have another kid and then this one gets you no know, treatment or something. You know, you have to work with them to be able to be successful. And, and if you are making excuses, oh, oh, this is a problem. Oh, this and oh, that and that. Then the results are going to, it's going to be a failure, essentially. Okay, when it can be a wonderful thing with wonderful results and everybody being happy. And you have many, many good, I mean, you have that experience. I mean, I'm, it's not that, but, but it's very important for everybody to be successful, not just 50% of the families. So, 
Um, I think these are the main concepts that we need to keep in mind when you start thinking about relapses is good technique, follow the protocols, be friends with the families really, use a brace that is very flexible, which will prevent most of the cases of relapses. So you don't need to be worried about relapses too much. Um, well, thank you very much. This is the new children hospital and I work in the second floor here. And if anybody's interested in um, visiting, happy to, uh, to help out on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jos, for excellent explanation about like why we develop relapse. I'm sure that uh, the next session is going to be even more interesting because we are going to understand how to treat relapse. Now I request uh, Dr. Rudra Prasad from Bangalore to uh, have some questions related to this. Rudra Prasad is like uh, looking after the Clubfoot Cure project in Southern India, and he has extensive experience of uh, managing the club food deformity. So Rudra, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deren. And uh, Dr. Joseph, it was very wonderful uh, seeing you uh, listening to the Eurolabs club food. In fact, uh, I just want to share you that I was there in Barcelona in 2014. Uh, mm. We were a group of people from India. We attended this meet, global club food meet, which was held at uh, uh, Barcelona. Anyway, so we have some questions. In fact, my other colleague, Dr. Uh, uh, Gupta, was supposed to be uh, moderating with the questions, but now I have some questions for you. And now we have this so much of variation in the incidence of relapse. What is your experience of relapse in your practice? Um, yes, um, and, and this is uh, our experience is that if you follow it, you have a phrase that is comfortable, and that is number one. And you follow, and you and the parents use the brace up to the age of five, four and a half, five, which usually the kids don't like it after that, usually. Um, then relapse rate is about 10%. So that, that's the key. It's, it's, it's nothing, you know, there's nothing special. It's just that the foot is going to get tight because those muscles are not going to grow unless they are stretched. And if you don't stress, then they are going to have relapses. And so there's no magic on this one. It just, you have to, and that's why I emphasize this lecture, because relapses is a prevention problem. Relapses is not a treatment problem. And if you do it right, you will have very few. And, and so the key really for everybody is, is try to get the best brace that you can and brace means comfortable shoes okay and and there are some and and it's challenging I'm, I'm not saying that it's not it's challenging to get braces okay in any country including the united states um but with that in mind um try to get the most comfortable one um, that is affordable for the family and then work with the family so they understand that they have to go to the age of five four to five, and that then you reduce 90% of the relapses. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Uh, and so um, if you don't do that, then you are going to have relapses all the time at the level of published literature, you know, 40 to 70%. 70%. But that's yeah. not the way to treat this, okay? The way to treat this is prevention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rudra, can I ask so a question? You... Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, please, Professor, please, go ahead. Yeah, Professor Markendo, yeah, like you asked that or you suggested that the stretching is the most important thing for prevention of the relapse. But when child starts crawling or when they start cruising and walking, already the muscles are going to be stretched. Then why they are getting this problem? Yeah, because during the night and they sleep about 12 hours, they are not stretching and, and then the food does that. So, and they don't have enough coordination and, and muscle strength and especially coordination, I think. Um, and so clinically until they are four or five, you know, natural development of, so the, a kid with clubfoot is a normal child. I mean, unless you have a symptom, right? But we're talking idiopathic. It's a normal child that has a stiffness built into the lower leg, but it's a normal child. So they, 
neuromuscular development is exactly the same as any other kiddo. And so it's not until the kids get to the age of four or five that they can jump in one leg and go up and down the stairs and so forth that they have enough power coordination that I think what happened is that until you get to that age, those muscles still don't have enough stretch to be able to, to be by themselves. Now, relapses change over time. And we didn't discuss that yet because we will do it next time. In the first year of life is pretty much 95 to 100%. In the second year of life, as you say, when the kids start walking and stuff, then yes, some of them don't relapse about 30 to 40%, okay? By the third year of life, there's about 30% that will relapse and 70% that not. So activity during the day, yes, is helping to stretch without the need for the braces after. Uh, and then by four years of age, it's about 15% and it stays that until seven or eight. So, so it's true that when the kids start walking and moving, then, then the relapses start coming down, but, but it's very slow. And it's not until four that, you know, most kids get out of trouble. Um, and there's no way clinically that you can say this one is going to relapse or not. There's a couple of things that can help you uh, clinically. Number one is how flexible overall the kid is. When the kids are super flexible, I mean, I'm not talking Marfans or something, you know, uh, you know, a lax kid. Those kids actually relapse less because they have more flexibility already. And even having a little stiffness in the leg is still, you know, because they have so much flexibility, they don't relapse as much. And most of those cases, by two, two and a half, if they stop the brace, they don't relapse. And those are the ones that you start seeing that they don't relapse if they don't use the brace after four. But the rest of them are going to keep relapsing. And on the other side, if you have a kid that is very strong and is, you know, it's very stiff and, and it only has 10 degrees dorsiflexion and, and it's always fighting the flexibility, you know that that kid and the leg is smaller compared with the other one. The skinny is the leg the more relapses and for longer period of time is going to relapse because those muscles are more involved. So when you see a kid that has, the legs are smaller and the flexibility is not very good, you know that that kid is going to be relapsing until five, six, seven or something. And, but those are the two extreme. Everybody in the middle is very hard. And so if you stop, you know, you know that the chances of relapses is very high still until the age about three to four. Yeah, one more observation is, you know, in our country, what uh, commonly the braces used are steam big braces, especially which is used in the Cure Club Food programs. Steam big braces we've been uh, using since quite some time, near to 10 years now, and then they're quite cheap, affordable, easily available. And uh, only thing is, uh, of course, we do see relapse close to around 30 to 40 percent, I can say. Say, but we recognize them and we treat them early with recasting and uh, tenant transfers and different things. Do you uh, do you have any idea about any particular brace in preventing the relapse, according to you, or is this a steam big brace, which has been a global uh, brace most most of the programs? Uh, what do you feel about this brace? Um, well, I haven't, I know the brace and, and- Did you get my question? Yes, yes. So I, I know the brace, I have not used it because we have the option to have other braces here in the United States. Um, so the, the brace that Dr. Ponceri developed 20 years ago, the uh, Mitchell brace, it was the most comfortable one at the beginning um, because this is all about comfort. It's not all the braces, work the same. It's two shoes and a connector that keeps the feet like this. All of them are going to work. Okay, my mechanically is the same, but the difference is how comfortable is the brace. And that's why, you know, with the Steinbeck brace, um, because it's made locally, the leather changes every time and, and it doesn't fit for everybody. And it gets hard as you use it many times. 
um, then it becomes uncomfortable. And, and when the kid is baby, they tolerate anything because they cannot talk. But when they get to two, two and a half, then it's like there's no way to use the brace all the night because the kid doesn't, he just cries and it's impossible. And, and so that's the reason why you are seeing so many relapses and probably starting at the age of two, two and a half because of that problem. Um, so one option that you have now, um, and, and I put my discussions at the beginning. So we develop a brace here at the University of Iowa and it's going through the university and, and uh, through the university, a nonprofit organization was established about actually 10 years ago. Um, and it's called the Iowa Brace. Okay. And it's the one that you, you saw the picture, the black boot things. Okay. Uh, the, the advantage of that one is that it's designed to be super comfortable and holding the foot well. Because the problem with the Mitchell is number one, um, it has a lot of skin problem because the strap in the middle is too tight. And you use it in some of your private patients, you see that they get a little red spot over here. And I can tell you that if you have a red spot, the kid is going to be uncomfortable. It's like if you have new shoes and you have a red spot in the back of the heel, it's uncomfortable. You don't use the shoe. You have to break in, right? So um, because of that, um, we developed the Iowa Brace. And the Iowa Brace is very cheap because it's a nonprofit. Um, there's no money to be made. And, um, and the price is, uh, is the price uh, a cost for any program. Okay. I don't know what will be the cost now. I know that uh, the managing director for, um, for the company, for the nonprofit, uh, uh, Top Becker, is working with somebody in India to bring the brace there. I will be happy to get you in connection with him. Um, and the advantage is, I mean, I, how much does it cost the stay back in your place? Average. It's a... Uh... It's it's about uh, you know thousand rupees. That's uh, how much is close it to, Yeah, twelve dollars. Twelve dollars. Twelve dollars. Ten, ten okay. to twelve dollars. Yes. Yeah. So so I think the price for the price for the Iowa probably is around twenty. I would say, which is still is not super high. I mean, it's not outrageously high. But the advantage that, I mean, when you look at this way and you look at program, as you are thinking, the advantage is if you prevent relapses, you are making money. Even if it costs you 20, but if you don't have, you have only 10% relapses, then you don't need to be using your time and everything else when you put it all together. And the second is that the brace can be used because it's used in many other programs now, especially in South America actually is the, is the continent that is um, actually uh, using it more frequently now. Um, you can use it up to three times because it's washable. You know, the yes. same as you cannot wash. Uh, but the, these braces are not charged. These braces are not charged. It's even free of cost by the cure organization. Yeah, you know, but of but course they have to whatever, take whatever, whatever, whatever people play, I mean, there's no problem, but but what I mean is that you can use it actually up to three times. So the brace for unit for the kid to use the brace is, is maybe about, you know, probably around $10 because you use it three yeah. times. And, and in, yeah. in, uh, in Latin America, they, they use it about two to three times average. The older kids maybe two times because they, you know, they are older and they can, you know, they move more, but the babies three times is a standard three, Two to four, but an average of three. So what that means that you know it becomes even cheaper uh, for a program. Yeah, the, is there the any difference? I mean, there's, no, there's no other magic. I mean, it's really is having a, a comfortable shoe. I mean, there's no there's no way around for relapses. Yes, certainly I agree with you because uh, we have seen these uncom uncomfortable. Uh, parents and even yeah. babies they don't sleep in the beginning and then we keep telling we keep telling reassuring the parents that you have to apply and they keep keep coming back and telling that you know we tried and you know the baby is not sleeping this is a common complaint we get it and some okay, of them now, who can afford we of course we do get it yeah, yeah please so go ahead we have, 
Do you have kids? You have children? Yes, yes. Okay, how many you have? I have one daughter. One daughter. How old is she? Now she's 22. Okay, well, but you know her very well, right? Yeah. What, what do you think in your own child, knowing your own child, if you have to have a brace, the brace that you are recommending to the parents, and you and your child have to use it for five years every night? Yes. In your child? Yeah, it's difficult. See? Okay, well, that is what everybody is facing. And that's why it's our responsibility as doctors to provide the best treatment that you can, you know, not the Mitchell brace, which is $300, you know, which that one is out of the question. But if you have an option or options to make the life of the patients and the parents better, it's going to be much better. I, every time I see a patient, I think about the parents and I think about my kids. I have two and they are in the 30s, okay, 34 and 31. And I know them because they're my kids, Miguel and Irene. If I have to do the bracing in one of them because every, each one has a different personality for five years every night, I know that I will be in trouble in my own kids because it's very, very hard. It's very hard. And, and, and that's why it's so important that we help them. It's not blaming them that they come and come and they don't use and Oh, you're not using it, you're not using it. No, 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 that's not the way to approach this issue. The way to approach this issue is how can I help this family to be successful? Because that's the way you are successful. It's through them. Uh, and so that's why you really need to think about, and, and I think, I mean, I don't know the financials and the stuff, but, but I will say that because Clafford Solution is a nonprofit organization, it's different from Mitchell. Mitchell is for profit, big time profit, okay? By the way, Mitchell has been bought, the company Orthopediatrics, which is the company for in the United States and I think in other countries, you know, for screws and plates and stuff. You know, and uh, they bought Mitchell and, and they give them a lot of money, millions of dollars for the company. And they went up with their price I think he's got. I think uh, we've lost the signal. Yeah. Yeah. We can wait for some time. Yeah. Uh, so Mitra, there uh, is another question he, which I have. Like, and yeah. I uh, before uh, we have a jaws with us, I would like to ask you: Like, do you go for any tendo Achilles stretching exercise for prevention of the relapse? And some of us they go for Evolter stimulating exercise. Means they try to. Uh, like tickle the medial border of the foot so that the foot is everted. So what is the role of such exercise in your understanding for prevention of the relapse? No, what I am uh, prescribing is, you know, definitely this uh, 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 stimulation of the everters. It's very difficult in some, these small kids, practically not possible. But what I recommend is the moment the child becomes little walking age or they can squat. That we just ask the parents to make the child squat. So naturally with the squat, with body weight and ground floor, there is a good stretching of the tendochilis. And also in between the bracing, in between whenever they remove the braces, we ask them to do some kind of a stretching exercises manually, like rotation and dorsiflexing the ankle. These are the exercises. We just ask them to do it. Uh, Dr. Jose is back. Uh, nice to have you back. Sorry. We had... Uh, My body. Yeah, we have... I have another question for you. Uh, is there any difference between late relapse versus early relapse? For example, uh, when we are putting a plaster, we achieve a correction. Even after the tenotomy, there is not much of a dorsiflexion. Even after the tenotomy, in some of the rigid feet, we have achieved all the uh, correction by the Pirani scoring. One, it is 1 to 1.5. We do the tenotomy. But still, we don't get complete dorsiflexion. And then we put the child in uh, plaster. We ask them to come back after three weeks and then we give a brace. 
and uh, what's your opinion on this very early recurrence are not achieving complete dorsiflexion um yeah well it depends on the age of the patient you know in i would say in the first two two and a half years um usually you get about 15 degrees of dorsiflexion um after the casting is a question of casting and and the casting done for relapses is critical um it's the same that in a baby um i would say you have to do above the knee most cases uh, because relapse is, is a relapsing is a, is a continuum because is as the grow as the bone keeps growing the muscles have to grow the same rate but they get behind so it depends on how long is been the patient out of the brace to when they present to your clinic so there's a graduation of relapses of tightness, uh, which is usually related to, to the time out of the brace. So some cases maybe come early and it's only maybe a little bit of dorsiflexion loss and a little, you know, and then with two casts, you are okay. And some cases they come with the foot like the first day. And in which case you just need to, con you know, do five, seven casts and tenotomy again and, and so forth. So so it would depend of, depending on how, you know, how much of a relapse is, uh, how stiff they are and how much time has passed. Um, you see, the, the key here is the technique of the casting. Um, we were talking uh, with Dirham uh, before we connected with all of you about neglected clubfoot. And I don't know what experience you guys have in neglected club food. I suppose you have quite a bit of experience. Uh, but now, the only patient that I know that has been treated with Coponsetti successfully is like a 60 years old lady in Colombia. And it was about 10 casts. So, you know, it's not as much as a stiffness, which, yes, there are a little bit difference between patients is the casting technique what it makes the difference actually for correction and and in relapses specifically and we can we discuss that next session you know using a long leg cast especially for those that are you know it, for me if you get neutral dorsiflexion so the relapse got to neutral dorsiflexion and a little adduction sometimes you can get by with short leg cast and you get about 15 degrees dorsiflexion. The, the thing in relapses also, which you know, which is the, the management part, is you if you have a lot of relapses, you don't want to be doing tenotomies every six to eight months because the brace, the patient don't use the brace, right? I mean, that's the problem. Because the problem on the relapses is the bracing. I mean, there's no way around. And so um, so doing a lot of tenotomies is 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 kind of I have a patient that had six tenotomies and the patient was three you know every six months we have a relapse because he was not using the brace and they would do two or three casts tenotomy go back to the brace not use the brace two or three casts tenotomy six I and mean, they all heal fine there's no problem i mean all, every tenotomy heals i don't know any single case in the world that in the idiopathic class where you do a tenotomy it doesn't heal they all heal because it's stiff tissue so it's just it just heals different from myelomeningos heal or or other you know neurological disease stuff but in idiopathic clafu they all heal but the question in relapses is not to do casting and tenotomies it's how you prevent that from happening again so um so the casting technique is critical uh, but i what i argue is that if you can correct a 45 years old person you know with clafu that is super rigid right I mean, it's like it's 45 years walking with a foot like this. And you can correct Absolutely. that with, you know, eight or 10 casts, um, even, you know, treating a relapse in a four years old, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. So, uh, but it's true that as they get, as the kid grows, um, and after four, three to five, which is usually when this happened in my experience, you only get about 10 to 15 degrees dorsiflexion. So when you look at the uh, long-term follow-up studies, and, and I think this is very important, and I will be happy to share with you, um, 
you, you might have them, but I would be happy to share with you a folder with, with papers um, that I have collected over time. Uh, but if you look at Dr. Ponseri's series, and I'm in mean the Iowa series from 1963 to 2016 or something, when we had the 50 year follow up, and you look at all the studies, and there are four of them, five. That just tells you how the patients do. And, and what we know is that up to the age of five or six or seven is about 10 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees dorsiflexion. When the patients go to adolescence, they go down to about 10. In early adulthood, about 30, there's about five average dorsiflexion and it stays the same up to 50. So, and remember, just remember that MRI of an adult patient I mean, it's like, there's no muscle there. It's all the stiffness. Yeah, patients are able to do a lot of things and not being having pain and be functional, but the biology is there. And so the dorsiflexion is, is it, it, it gets down as the patient ages. And by 10, it's about 10, 10 degrees. Um, and then it goes down to five to 10 in adolescence and stay the same for the rest of their life. So, so you don't need to, and this is another, another issue for relapses. Um, you don't need to, when you treat a relapse, to do a posterior release to get five more degrees of dorsiflexion because the tenotomy only give you five. Because I can tell you two things. Number one, in within a year, you lose all the dorsiflexion because it's getting very tight. And number two, if you look at the paper of Dr. Dobbs on the 30-year follow-up study, in that study, there were a group, it was patients treated surgically for clubfoot, and it makes no difference if it is uh, one year old or four years old, okay, by the way. Um, there were 13 patients that had only a posterior release, and they had the same outcomes that they would have a posterior medial release. And there's another two or three papers on the ones that I show you the functionality coming down that posterior releases doesn't let you do dorsiflexion. And if you do dorsiflexion and the motion of the subtalar joint gets affected at the same time, then the long-term results actually are impairing the, the patient dramatically. So, so with all those in mind, all, all those factors, then the keys Again, I'm sorry, it just, I know it's difficult. It's prevention, prevention, prevention. And then if you have relapses, which you will see, then the casting technique makes a difference and, and try to get about 10 degrees dorsiflexion, um, especially after the age of three, and, and, and try not to have to do tenotomies. But there's a balance between pushing too hard and do a tenotomy because you are flattening the talus, which is the problem in the long run. So you have a lot of relapses and this is the other problem, see? If you have a lot of relapses, you know, two or three relapses in a baby up to the age of four, you are flattening the talus every time you are pushing cars. And, 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 and that is a problem in the long run. So, so that's why you prevent that from happening by keeping the flexibility in the brace at night. You allow that talus to be as round as possible, which in the long run is going to provide a better flexibility, right? That if it is less round. And, and so those factors are critical to be thinking about it. And, 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 you know, and the key here is keep flexibility. And, and the key is, you know, having a comfortable brace. And this is just, it, otherwise, you know, this is what happened, you know, it's like, what do you do with this? What do you do with that? What kind of surgery do you do for this? Or what kind of surgery do you do for that? And, and the truth is that if you reduce the prolapses to that level, then you are going to be doing very few surgeries. And most of them are, I mean, the only one practically 95% of the time is just a tendon transfer. And I think today in the world, the most problematic management issue in clubfoot is relapses. Everybody does a good job in babies, but treating relapses is a key. That's why I was so happy that you invited me to, you know, to, um, to talk about relapses because that's the key. And the key is racing. 
So somehow you have to convince the government, the organization, or whoever that you need to have a comfortable brace and you will see your life will change dramatically. Dramatically. That, that's an amazing message, Dr. Jose. I think uh, we will stick to that and certainly we'll follow that. I think we have taken a good time, Dr. Diren. I think one and a half hour we have, without even noticing the time, it's just flying. So uh, I think we'll keep the uh, uh, discussion for the next session. Uh, I, I thank Dr. Jose Markunde for his time and wonderful uh, message about preventing the deformity to re relapse. So thanking to hear you again. And in the next session, we will discuss more about the same situation. Thank you, Dr. Devan. Yeah. Thank you, Jaws. And bye-bye. And see you soon. Yeah. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.